The three wise men who give gifts to Jesus uh, are known as the Magi. You probably know that term, the Magi. I suppose it's Magus in Latin, is wise men, perhaps. Magi. And uh, one of the most famous short stories in the world is one written by O. Henry, uh, an American short story writer, and it's called The Gift of the Magi. And I don't know if you had to read it in school, but I remember in Ireland we had to read it, you know, for, for an examination purpose. So the gift of the Magi, the short story, is about a young couple who loved each other more and more every year they were married. And yet they had very little money. And so... One Christmas came along when they had no money at all for buying presents. And in fact, uh, they had only two things uh, in their possession that was of any value at all or that they were proud of at all. One was the uh, young woman's long blonde hair, which came right down to her waist, and they were both very proud of that. And the other was a gold watch, that the husband had that had been given to him by his father. Those were the two most precious things that they could be proud of. They had very little else in their home. So the week before Christmas, they went out round the stores uh, shopping like everybody else, except that they had no money and they couldn't buy anything. And uh, they would keep going round the same stores, especially two stores. There was one that had two golden combs, a pair of golden combs in it that they both knew would look just beautiful in the wife's hair. And the other store had a beautiful gold chain that would look magnificent on the husband's watch. And they used to wander around those stores during that week repeatedly, even though they felt they have no chance of ever buying those things. And so... Christmas morning arrived, and they came down to the living room where they usually exchanged their presents, and uh, the husband could see a, a kind of light of excitement in his wife's eyes, and she could see the same in his eyes, except that his changed to horror when he saw that she had cut off all her hair, and uh, so dejectedly he brought out the present that he had bought for her. You can guess, the golden combs. But, I mean, she had now no hair to put them on, so it was useless. However, she kind of picked herself up and continued to seem to be excited, and she brought out her present to him, which was the chain, the gold chain for his watch. And he smiled and said, well, you obviously sold your hair to buy the chain for my watch, but I don't have a watch. I pawned my watch to buy the combs for your hair. And O. Henry says, these two foolish people stumbled on the central factor in giving gifts, that of love. That if there isn't weeks, love we're going behind to giving a, a gift, of time it's of no value. And if there is love, find out what real it love doesn't is, much matter if the gift and works contrasting right it with not. all the wrong ideas the that we in our 20th century have of love. So we're going to spend some time on this verse. But loved ones, could we just settle this fact this morning? That God says to us, now I'm assuming from all the signs that you people have around you, that you know you exist only because somebody else has loved you. So I'm assuming that you yourselves see that your lives will only work if they're run through and flooded and surrounded by your love. Now, I'm saying to you, let your love be real. Let it be real and true and genuine, not something that you put on. And the basis of all that, you see, is, is those verses that I think many of us have re read before. They're in 1 John. 1 John, and it's chapter 4. 
and verse 7. 1 John 4 and verse 7. It's page 1067. 1067. 1 John 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent a son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No man has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. What is love unfeigned and love undissembled? Oh, Jesus, hanging, bleeding on the cross... And saying to you, I want to assure you that all the evil that you have in your heart that has to be destroyed, I have taken into my own heart and I am bearing it through hell's fire so that it will be destroyed forever and so that you will be able to go into my Father's presence without fear of extermination. That's love, unfeigned. You know. It's no bluff. The man's dying. He's dying. And he's telling you that he's taken the worst that you have produced in your heart into his own heart freely because he loves you. That's love that gives completely and without reservation gives itself for the highest purposes known to man. That's what real love unfeigned and undissembled is. And so, loved ones, I, I just ask you and ask myself, is love the basic attitude in each of our lives? Is love the basic attitude that you and I have to the people that we work with? That's right. To our colleagues. Do we love our colleagues at work? Do we love the fellow students we have in our classes at school? Is love the governing attitude in our relationship to them, or is it competition, rivalry, trying to keep one up? Is our basic attitude to our people that we live with, either our family or our relatives or our roommates, is the basic attitude love? Do we love? Is our life girded round about with love? And I'd ask you, well, is it? You know, and, and it is horrifying, isn't it, how we can so often find that our life is, is governed by paranoia, maybe, or governed by competitiveness, or governed by insecurity or governed by struggling to keep our heads above water, but not governed by love. And yet, God is saying to us, look, that's the only thing that makes life work. And could it not be that that's why you and I have so much trouble with things in life? Could it be that what your marriage needs is a bit more just love? Very interesting these days when we talk so much about communication. And we all think that communication will solve everything in marriage. Well, communication helps, but what marriage most needs is love. And it's the same in our labor relationships, in our businesses. What they most need is love. And actually, you know if you and I were talking individually together alone without all these other people around, you know that you'd say, yeah, boy, love has some kind of softening effect on me. When I see somebody really loves me, boy, I'd do anything for them. It makes everything worthwhile. 
makes everything possible if a person loves me. And loved ones, that's why I say to all of us this morning, God is saying to us, let love, which is the only cement that will hold all of life together, let love be real and genuine and undissembled without dissimulation. Let it be genuine. Let it not be something that you assume in order to impress somebody with. Because the truth is, even if love sells its hair to buy a chain for your watch, and you sell your watch to buy combs for love's hair, somehow the Christmas is the greatest success because love was there. And it's the same with our lives. Love makes everything work. So let us accept what God says, that love is to be the basic attitude of each of us in our whole lives towards everyone we meet, the drivers on the road, the people in the stores, and let our love be genuine. Over the next weeks, I pray that God will make this clear to us what love is. But I would encourage us to look at different parts of our lives and see is there any love in them? Is there any love in my relationship to my wife? Is there any love in my relationship to my friends at work? And my surprise is, you know, how cold things have been allowed to get for us. Let us pray. Dear Father, we've known from we were children that God is love. We know that off by heart. We know too, Lord, that all the songs say what the world needs is love. And we talk a lot about it. But Lord, we do realize how little of it there is in our own attitudes and how hard life can become when we put love into the background. Lord, we would bring it into the foreground now. When we consider the people that we work with tomorrow and the people that we study with, Lord, we're going to start showing them some love. Just show them some love, some understanding. Just forbear a little and Stop just dealing with them justly, as we think, according to what they deserve. But begin to deal with them the way you've dealt with us, beyond and far better than we deserve. Lord, we're going to start dealing that way with our friends and our relatives. Father, when we see how many arguments we get into and we think we're right just because we've made a valid point, Lord, we see that we would be finished if you argued that way with us. You have graciously refused to press your rights. You have graciously refused to point the spear the whole way home. And Lord, we would begin to love our friends and our dear ones and begin to allow love and the Holy Spirit who brings love to introduce some restraint and some grace into our lives together. Lord, we thank you that we're only here because of your love. And it's no wonder to us that love is what makes the world go round. And it's what makes our lives work. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to beginning to love and to love in reality and in truth during these coming days. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.